One of the first Americans to lead a movement for slave reparations was a woman named Callie House. She was born into slavery, freed after the Civil War, married at 22, and widowed in her 30s. By the late 1890s, she was raising five children and working as a seamstress. She was also helping to start an association for former slaves that did things like pay for medical care or burials. Importantly, it also demanded pensions from the federal government as compensation for slavery. Callie traveled all over the South recruiting for the association. Eventually, she signed up some 300,000 dues-paying members, and she sent petitions to Washington asking for reparations. She also encouraged her members to do the same. They proposed a system modeled on money that had been awarded to disabled Civil War soldiers. All ex-slaves would get a monthly pension starting at about $4 a month, that's around $125 in today's money. How did Washington respond? The post office issued a fraud order against Callie and members of the association. They said she was using the mail to encourage people to ask her something they'd never get. When Callie got the letter forbidding her from using the Postal Service for her campaign, she was shocked. Then she got mad. The historian Mary Frances Berry tells the story in a book called My Face is Black is True, Callie House and the Struggle for Ex-Slave Reparations. Here she reads Callie's scathing 1899 reply to the post office. And she said the association acted on behalf of, quote, four and a half million slaves who were turned loose, ignorant, barefooted, and naked without a dollar in their pockets, without a shelter to go under out of the falling rain but was forced to look the man in the face for something to eat, who once had the power to whip them to death, but now have the power to starve them to death. We, the ex-slave, feel that if the government had a right to free us, she had a right to make some provision for us. As she did not make it soon after our emancipation, she ought to make it now, unquote. For the next 15 years, Callie and the Association continued to petition the government. For its part, the post office kept marking their mail fraudulent. It either returned it to senders or destroyed it. In 1916, Callie was arrested and then indicted on charges of mail fraud. An all-white jury found her guilty, and she went to prison for one year. And when she got out of prison, she kept the movement up, and then she got sick. And she eventually passed away without adequate uh, medical treatment. At that time, the idea of reparations was so preposterous and threatening to the power structure in Washington, it labeled the entire effort fraudulent. But the idea of reparations never went away. A hundred years later, we're still debating what, when, and how to talk about it. On the 2020 campaign trail, when asked about reparations, Joe Biden said he was willing to consider what the U.S. might owe African Americans. Reparations means making up for things that happened in the past. Number one, there is a study being suggested by a former presidential candidate and a guy who's a friend of mine from New Jersey saying we should study reparations and make a judgment whether or not what they should be, what they should do. There are certain things we already know, and I support that study. Let's see where it takes us. It was an unusually blunt statement for an American presidential candidate to make about reparations. But in some parts of the U.S., politicians and policymakers are moving from words to action. There were, there are a couple of things and a couple of ways to look at the whole question of reparations. How exactly are you going to repay the debt of slavery and who is going to repay? Slavery is the original sin. Slavery has never received an apology. Crimes have been committed. Sins have been committed. There is a blood debt. I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. 
14 trillion dollars in reparation is an appropriate statement. It's not real reparations unless you give the descendants of slavery actual money and let them choose how they want to spend it as if they're adults. Ooh. Welcome back to The Paycheck. I'm Jackie Simmons. And I'm Rebecca Greenfield. We've gone through the stats about the racial wealth gap. And as we start to talk about reparations, what's important to remember is that life in America has improved for Black people. But no matter how much better it gets, the gap has never closed. Not only that, but roundabout efforts to close it like creating more equal opportunities for Black families to build wealth and pass it on to their children, haven't done enough either. Reparations suggest a bigger, more direct kind of action. An admission of wrongdoing, for one. That the U.S. harmed its Black citizens. And then money. Redress in one form or another. At a scale that's commensurate with the harm done. Historically, as a country, we've been reluctant to consider any of this. Thirty years ago, John Conyers Jr., a congressman from Michigan, introduced legislation, H.R. 40, to establish a commission to study and develop reparations proposals. It didn't ask for reparations. It asked for a commission to study the issue. That went nowhere in 1989. Conyers introduced it in the next Congress, and the next, and in every session for more than two decades. After he resigned, Sheila Jackson Lee, a black congresswoman from Texas, took up the charge. In 2014, ta Coates published a 16,000-word article in The Atlantic magazine called The Case for Reparations. The cover of the issue was black with white text that read, 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of state-sanctioned redlining, until we reckon with the compounding moral debts of our ancestors, America will never be whole. Coates's article became the argument for reparations. Ron Daniels is a leader of the National African American Reparations Commission, an independent group that's fighting for reparations. He says the piece restarted the public dialogue. And now the idea is getting more attention than it ever has. So you really have had a uh, almost seismic shift in support of, uh, of reparations. This is a monumental moment in the history of these United States of America. As we were finishing this episode, House Committee was debating H.R. 40. And for the first time, legislators were considering bringing the discussion to the full House. Maybe this time it will pass, and that commission will study how reparations could work and most importantly, how much they would cost. Maybe, after some time, we'll have some answers. In the meantime, academics have been coming up with answers of their own, trying to calculate just how much is owed. Susan Burfield, a reporter at Bloomberg, is going to help us break down the math. So first, advocates argue that reparations must ultimately be paid by the federal government. It's the government that's responsible for the laws that kept African Americans enslaved. It's the government that allowed and perpetuated discrimination that benefited white Americans afterward. It's the government that can afford to pay the debt in full. When it comes to the amount that's due, most believe that reparations should at least close the racial wealth gap. That's the minimum. And there's different ways to get there. Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen, who co-wrote a book about reparations, begin with the loss of land promised after emancipation, that 40 acres and the mule. They end up with about $12 trillion. One of their colleagues, Thomas Kramer, starts with another loss, the unpaid wages African Americans could have earned for their forced labor from American independence to the start of the Civil War. Kramer's German. His family was close to a Holocaust survivor who received reparations from the government for Nazi atrocities. He says the money's important, of course, but it's much more than that. It's the moral reckoning. 
the amount paid is basically a symbolic gesture that the apology is meant seriously and that, that the perpetrating side makes a promise never to repeat what was done. Now he's an associate professor at the University of Connecticut looking at reparations in America and what they would mean. He's done some calculations. The number of enslaved people times all the hours they could have worked each year times the wages they should have been paid. Then he took those lump sums and applied a 3% interest rate to figure out how much those earnings would have grown from 1776 to today. He estimates that the descendants of the enslaved are owed about $20 trillion. It's an astounding amount. It's nearly as much as the United States' gross domestic product last year. Kramer also says it's on the low end. Because I'm ignoring colonial slavery, and in this calculation I'm also ignoring racial discrimination after uh, slavery, and both of those injustices of course had Im impact on the ability to accumulate wealth among black families. So this is a very conservative calculation. He says he wanted to figure the least amount of money that could be considered fair. Assuming that there are about 42 million descendants of slavery in the U.S. today, and accounting for taxes already paid, Kramer says each is due $426,000. Darity and Mullen's slightly lower number, that $12 trillion, would work out to about $300,000 per person, give or take. Whatever the amount, the money could be repaid through a national trust, community development programs, free college, no interest loans, baby bonds, a guaranteed income, or cash. No one is handing out checks anytime soon. But it's an intriguing idea. For most people, $300,000 isn't never work again money, but it would be life-changing. We asked you to tell us what that kind of money might change. What would I do if I were given $300,000? Um, a lot, I think. Securing a house, um, being able to pay the mortgage for a while. Receiving reparations would give me the peace of mind to do things like starting a family and making a career change. First thing I would probably do is to pay off any outstanding debt. Um, I would pay off the house I bought a year ago. Things that my peers who have the safety net of generational wealth behind them can do right now. After paying off my student loan debt, I would be able to actually afford a home for my family. It would be actually very helpful as my other African-American co-founders of a startup we're working on have been in fundraising mode for quite a while. I would allocate 100000 of that towards retiring any and all debt I may have. Invest in um, a retirement fund. Low cost uh, index funds. Actually get into um, the, the, the stock market. Low fee uh, crypto. Use the remaining 100000 to allocate uh, towards uh, any business or entrepreneurial aspirations for one or all of my three children. So as to continue the uh, generational uh, support and the forward movement of monies through our African American generations and through our family. If I could find a multifamily home, maybe a triplex or a duplex for three hundred thousand, that would be the thing that would provide me with some some legacy for my children. So, what would you do with three hundred thousand dollars? Precisely the things that build wealth, that fulfill promise and in just the ways long denied to African Americans. That brings us back to the other question. Where would the U.S. get that kind of money? Kramer says that when the Haitian and British governments paid reparations to slave owners, they borrowed the money, lots of it, over many decades. Ron Daniels points to a moment where the U.S. government had no trouble conjuring up a couple trillion dollars in a matter of months. The COVID pandemic has also shown us something else. That quite frankly, there is no limit to the amount of money that the federal government can spend. Woof, it's trillionaire, two trillionaire. So money is not the object. The thing is, for a lot of people, money is exactly the problem. It's one reason full reparations are probably a long ways off. 
But for now, cities across the U.S. and the state of California are beginning to study whether there's a case for local reparations and what that might look like. One city has been working on this for the past few years. It's asked the hard questions and answered them. Soon, it will begin paying what it's calling reparations to some of its Black residents. Evanston, Illinois, just north of Chicago, with some 75,000 people living in eight square miles, calls itself progressive. About 16% of the city's residents are Black. Some of their families have lived there for more than 100 years. There's also a legacy of housing discrimination. Evanston, like almost every American city, made it difficult for Black people to buy their own homes and to keep the homes they could buy. It deprived them of potential wealth, of generational wealth. And it's that injustice, not slavery, that Evanston is first attempting to repair. We were lifting up the name of the Black community and making affirmations and commitments and ceremonial resolutions and proclamations. We were doing that very, very well um, in Evanston. And yet we still uh, maintained a racial divide. Robin Rue Simmons was born and raised in Evanston, fourth generation. She's been a real estate broker and a bookstore owner. She started a construction firm. She owns and manages affordable housing and commercial property in Evanston. She was also representing the city's fifth ward on the council, one of nine aldermen, as they're called. And she's the one who first proposed that Evanston consider reparations. She says that there's an average household income difference of $46,000 between black and white Evanston, a 13-year difference in life expectancy, education gaps and opportunity gaps and information divides. In February 2019, Robin was about midway through her first term on the city council when she wrote an email to Evanston's Equity and Empowerment Commission. The subject line read, Black Equality Policy. You opened it and it said, because reparations makes people uncomfortable. She thanked them again for their efforts, but said it was time to do more. I realize that not one policy or one proclamation can repair the damage done to Black families But in this 400th year of African-American resilience, I'd like to pursue policy and actions as radical as the racial policies and actions that got us to this point. Later, she would be more explicit, that she believed reparations were the only way to address the harm in the Black community in Evanston and beyond. Yes, it is reparations. Let's not call it anything else to make you feel better about your role in it or our inability to address it before now. Let's call it what it is. Segregation began in Evanston in the years before World War I, as Black Southerners migrated north. By 1918, a local paper reported on a plan to, quote unquote, freeze out Black residents from all parts of Evanston except for the Fifth Ward. The city began by targeting Black residents in other parts of town. The housing codes could change to, say, require indoor plumbing or electricity or other home improvements. A Black family might not have the cash for that and then wouldn't be able to get a loan to pay for it either. Then they'd be forced to sell, sometimes for less than what their home was worth. Afterward, real estate agents would steer them to the Fifth Ward. Banks, if they gave mortgages, would do so only for homes in the Fifth Ward. Redlining officially began in the 1930s. So did a long period of underinvestment by the city, predatory loans, and contract buying. That's when Black residents who couldn't get a mortgage had to put down a lot of money for a house then pay monthly installments at high interest rates. But they didn't get the title until the house was completely paid for. They never got equity, and they could be evicted any time they missed a payment. Morris Robinson Jr. is the founder of Evanston's Shorefront Legacy Center. He has hundreds of documents showing how all this unfolded, including a report written in 1940 by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a government agency. That agency was created to insure loans, which allowed more people to purchase homes and eventually would help develop the suburbs. 
It was a great deal, if you were white. It was, in fact, explicitly intended to maintain segregated neighborhoods. He read to me the agency's evaluation of Black Evanston. Here lives the servants for many of the families all along the North Shore. There is not a vacant house in the territory, and occupancy, moreover, is about 150% for most houses have more than one family living in them. This concentration of Negroes in Evanston is quite a serious problem for the town as they seem to be growing steadily and encroaching into adjoining neighborhoods. When Robin brought up the idea of reparations in 2019, one of the first things the Equity Commission agreed to was to host community meetings to ask what residents wanted from a reparations program. Out of dozens and dozens and dozens of recommendations, housing continued to um, be an area of concern and a recommendation of repair. That focus was key for Robin and her colleagues. They knew, more or less, what they were paying reparations for, at least initially. Now they needed the money to pay for it. This is where the broad conversation about reparations comes up hard against reality. Where's the money going to come from? In this respect, Evanston got a little lucky. It was exactly at the time where we started doing adult cannabis. Ann Rainey was representing the 8th Ward, the one closest to Chicago. She pointed out that years of prohibition had a disproportionate impact on Black people. That is why the adult cannabis legislation was passed to begin with, to make reparations in that area. So that's where we're going to take the money to support this program. It was a tax, first of all, we had never realized before, so we weren't going to be taking it from anything. The city council estimated that the 3% sales tax on legal weed would bring in about a million dollars a year. They'd set aside the first $10 million. So $10 million for reparations over 10 years. Not all for housing. How should the city use all that money? What other harm did the community suffer? What other debts did Evanston owe? That first resolution didn't say. They'd work out the details later. The loose terms bothered one alderman, Thomas Sufferden. And on November 25th, 2019, he was the only person to vote no. All right. Resolution 126-R-19, establishing a a city of Evanston funding source about local reparations, passes on a eight to one vote. Congratulations. All right. For all the hard work to get there, there'd be lots more to come. Maybe more than anyone on the council realized. But right then... I remember just wanting to jump and scream and celebrate And it was business as usual. We went on with the agenda and I'm sitting looking like, okay, we just, we're just gonna keep on. About two weeks later, actor and activist Danny Glover came to Evanston and spoke in front of a very big, very excited crowd. Here's Glover. And then you'll hear Michael Neighbors, a pastor and president of the local NAACP. It is the beginning of a process. This is the, the, the most intense conversation I believe that we're going to have in the 21st century right here, reparations. It it was one of the most electrifying moments that I can ever remember having. And and I've had a few of them. I've been around, you know, (laughs) I've had I've I've had a few electrifying moments. But this one was electrifying in the local sense. It was electrifying for the city of Evanston. And it was particularly um, electrifying for um, the black community. And then it was back to work on all those details. When Evanston's only dispensary began selling recreational pot on January 1st, 2020, there was a line down the street. During the pandemic, the state deemed the dispensaries essential businesses, but the city wasn't allowed to collect taxes until July. The council decided to start its reparations program with $400,000. This is where the policy's ambitions collided with its particulars probably inevitably. People might agree that damage has been done. They might agree that restitution should be made. But to whom? And for how much? And who first? Even in a relatively small, progressive town like Evanston, the answers to those questions were neither clear nor simple. First, who's eligible? The city council had a mandate to initially focus on housing. So it settled on grants, 
to help qualified Black residents buy homes, fix up their homes, or stay in their homes. All Black residents? Well, the priority is any Black resident of Evanston from 1919 to 1969, then any of their direct descendants, and then anyone who moved to the city after that and can show that they've faced discrimination. And the big question, how much? The council decided on grants of $25,000, not a lot of money in Evanston, where the average home sells for 12 times that. And no matter what, most Black residents won't get anything this first round. That $400,000 covers awards for 16 people to start with. That's a tough number, another reality check. There's other restrictions. The residents won't get the cash directly. That might require them to pay taxes on it. Instead, the money will go to the financial institution, closing agent, or contractor the resident is working with. Robin says she and her colleagues want residents to be able to work with local Black-owned businesses and banks that have a history of fair lending. The Fifth Ward, she points out, doesn't have a bank, has never had a bank. And Black people have every reason to be skeptical of a financial system that's taken every advantage of them for centuries. If we do not give them an introduction to a bank that has fair banking products and uh, other sort of consumer products, then we have not accomplished anything. And, And furthermore, if we introduce them to a bank that has high fees and rates and it is expensive to bank with them, then we have not accomplished anything. In late March, the council took a second crucial vote this time on whether or not to begin distributing the first allotment, that $400,000. Just a few weeks before, a group emerged on Facebook. It's called Evanston Rejects Racist Reparations. Up until then, there had been some questions, some concerns about the program, but no organized opposition. The founders of the group are Black residents of Evanston. They wanted the council to delay the start of the program. They say it's too small that it shouldn't focus only on housing. It shouldn't require recipients to work with banks and other financial institutions that have discriminated against the Black community. It shouldn't even be called reparations. There are some admirable efforts made by municipalities to atone for the damages caused by their own race-based policies. However, it is unfortunate when those acts of atonement are confused with reparations. Uh, A limitation of the proposal that's brought forward is that the funds are constrained to home ownership. Home ownership is only part of the deficit in assets held by Black Americans. And I want you to think about this. If any of your family members, their house was burned down, they were killed, car was crashed, and then someone walks up and says, here's 25 cent as a good start. And I promise to do better later to give you back what you lost. That's what that looks like and feels like to us. That was the authors Kirsten Mullen and Sandy Darity and Malika Gardner, the founder of Evanston Live TV, speaking at that city council meeting. Lots of others said they were proud of their city, that the program was a good start and one that was a long time coming. Cicely Fleming, one of the council's three Black members, had already announced her decision. She'd oppose moving forward with what's now called the Evanston Local Reparations Restorative Housing Program. I think reparations is, you know, somewhat of a sacred term and a thing that people have waited for for hundreds of years and to, you know, even on the local level, kind of water it down to a housing plan, even at the first effort, I know this is the first plan, we take these crumbs and hope that we're going to get more crumbs later instead of just saying, you know, we deserve a whole piece of cake. The measure passed with Fleming the only no vote. I think it it is a good housing plan. I think people will use it and need it. Um, But I want them to reach higher, right? I want Black folks to to want freedom. Afterward, the reparations experts, Kirsten Mullen and Sandy Darity, continued to argue that Evanston's program wasn't actually reparations. In an op-ed in the Washington Post, they wrote, True reparations only can come from a full-scale program of acknowledgement, redress, and closure for a grievous injustice. This is an argument over more than just semantics. It's an argument over what's possible and what's necessary and how far America will go. Should reparations, the word, the idea, 
be reserved for that big debt owed by the federal government, the $300,000 or more that would close the racial wealth gap? Or can it also be smaller efforts to redress local injustice? Evanston's answered that for itself. Robin and her colleagues say that what they're doing has to be just a first step. Robin decided not to run for re-election, so she'll give up her seat in May. But she'll be a community member of Evanston's new reparations committee, an advisor on other local initiatives, and an advocate for H.R. 40. So we are moving forward knowing that this is not going to bring us full repair. We understand that more reparation programming is necessary. We understand that Black residents need access to cash and deserve it. But we also understand that this is a process and waiting any longer is irresponsible. The reactions in Evanston shouldn't be surprising. Restitution is complex and emotional and at the local level won't ever be enough. The city council expects that by the fall, it will have selected the first group of black residents to receive the housing grants. Policymakers and citizens, advocates and critics will be watching, evaluating, maybe hoping. If the U.S. were to go down the path of federal reparations, it could look to other countries that have paid money to populations that have been harmed. Next week on The Paycheck, we head to the U.K., where the government is in the midst of what it's calling a compensation scheme for its Black residents. It's less of a model than a cautionary tale. There are a number of problems with the compensation scheme, and the obvious one is that the scheme itself lacks independence. The hostile environment policy uh, was a policy that discriminated against immigrants to this country, and it was a policy that was implemented by the UK government. So there is a bit of a case of the government marking its own homework. Thanks for listening to The Paycheck. If you like this show, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was hosted by me, Rebecca Greenfield. And me, Jackie Simmons. Today's episode was edited by Janet Paskin and reported by Susan Bearfield with the help of Jordan Holman. We also want to thank all of our listeners who took the time to call or send in voice memos about reparations. This episode was produced by Magnus Henriksen. We also had production help from Lindsay Cradwell and editing help from Francesca Levy, Rakshita Saluja, Jackie Simmons, David Shear, and me. Our original music is by Leo Sidron. Francesca Levy is Bloomberg's head of podcasts. We'll see you next time.